I'm Paul McGuire. On today's program, we're going to give you a prophetic emergency alert. And this is what's happening in, in a nutshell. In a what's happening is that this coronavirus, COVID-19, which originally escaped from Wuhan, China, uh, from a level four, that's the highest level bacteriological warfare laboratory there is, the highest uh, <clears throat> safety precautions. Now, um, we don't know a whole lot about that except that they say, well, it was like an innocent virus. Well, what, what's an innocent virus? I don't know what an innocent virus is. It could have been some virus that monkeys gave each other. I mean, what's it with the monkeys and the uh, humanists and the uh, evolutionary theory people and their monkeys? What is it with their monkeys, really? <laughs> they said this female scientist uh, got these infected monkeys, supposedly, <clears throat> approximately 200 miles away from the Wuhan Level 4 laboratory. And then I guess it got mixed up at a local market with monkey meat or something. I have no idea, okay? All we do know is that the laboratory from which the coronavirus escaped is a, the highest level biological warfare lab. So that means in that laboratory, there has to be a whole lot of very, very bad potions, poisons, viruses, bacteria, etc. And all these heavy duty super precautions to protect people like scientists from, from getting infected. Maybe you've seen all these movies on biological warfare. I can think of uh, the movie. It was a very gripping movie, but it was intense. 28 Days Later, the, the, the original one and the sequel, and <clears throat> it took place in um, uh, England, and it was a devastating movie of a zombie apocalypse and uh, about a biological warfare agent that escaped from a lab, and it was terrifying. And then there was the movie Z with uh, Brad Pitt, not that great of a movie, but in a hermetically sealed <coughs> biological warfare lab where the biological warfare got loose. And then you have movie after movie after movie with similar themes. You go back to uh, a movie, <coughs> oh, it must be 30 years old. Uh, I can't even remember the name of it. It's uh, it Outbreak. Uh, Dustin Hoffman and some other people. And movie after movie after movie. And not only that, you have episodic uh, TV series after episodic TV series. You have those two horror movies where the people uh, <clears throat> had to go silent. And if they made any noise like singing or talking, these former human beings who became zombies through some kind of biological warfare outbreak would attack them. So, what does all that mean? Well, in addition to all that, um, in my own personal life, <clears throat> not that I'm obsessed with biological warfare, believe me, I'm not, but because I did, I began an in-depth study in the areas of Bible prophecy many years ago, and I have not uh, continued to stop since then, uh, I studied the signs of the times that Jesus Christ talked about in Matthew 24 and 25. And Jesus Christ warned his disciples that in the last days there would be wars and rumors of wars. There would be uh, uh, <clears throat> a racial group fighting a racial group, nation against nation, an ethnic group fighting an ethnic group. Now usually you don't hear uh, preachers get into this much detail. I'm going to bend down and get <clears throat> my Bible. I always carry my Bible into the studio with me. In fact, there's usually four or five Bibles on the floor all around me and four or five books and notes like crazy that, that you don't see, but they're here. Now, um, in Matthew, we have the passage in Matthew 
called the signs of the times where Jesus Christ gives his disciples uh, they say well Jesus what will be this, the signs of your coming at the end of the age and Jesus said to his disciples in Matthew 24 he gave them what, what in terms of Bible prophecy which is Bible eschatology I'm a professor of uh, uh, Bible eschatology which is just a fancy way of saying I'm a professor of Bible prophecy now um, so Jesus says in Matthew 24 he's talking to his disciples behind him is Herod's magnificent temple and the temple was huge and it was splendid and it was standing there and Jesus was looking into their eyes and talking to his disciples and behind Jesus' disciples was this giant <coughs> temple in Jerusalem uh, partially built by King Herod it was a magnificent Jewish temple then Jesus went out, Matthew 24, verse 1, Then Jesus went out and departed from the temple, and his disciples came up to him, the building of the temple. And Jesus said to them, Do you not see all these things? Assuredly, I say to you, not one stone shall be left here upon another, and shall not be thrown down. So Jesus Christ is warning the disciples that this magnificent temple behind them, Herod's temple, is going to be violently torn down stone by stone. Now that was a mind-blowing visual, or as our media likes to call it today, I don't like the term optics, but the media loves it, so let's just use their word, optics. The optics on this for the disciples were that there was going to be a generation soon coming. This was going to happen soon where the Roman general Titus was going to invade Jerusalem and tear down the temple brick by brick and sell the Jews into slavery to the four corners of the world. And this would happen shortly after Christ descended into heaven and then promises his disciples that he's going to return at the second coming. So, uh, verse 3, Now as he sat on the Mount of Olives, the disciples came to him privately, saying, Tell us, when will these things be? And what will be the sign of your coming and of the end of the age? They all wanted to know from Jesus what was going to be this like ultimate final sign that's going to prove your coming right now. The Jews had been waiting expectantly for the coming of the Messiah for thousands and thousands of years. This is something that was central in their uh, religious beliefs, that the Messiah would return to Israel and that he would rule and reign planet Earth from Jerusalem along with the co-regent King David for a 1,000 year millennial reign of Jesus Christ. And um, Jesus uh, is the rightful ruler of planet Earth. He's King of Kings and Lord of Lords. And Jesus is doing this in fulfillment with his Abrahamic covenant that he made with the children of Israel, which was to give the physical descendants of Abraham the physical land of Israel as an everlasting covenant. And so Jesus fulfills that when he returns from heaven on a white horse with the armies of heaven coming down with him, also wearing, uh, they're riding white horses. Now think about this. All the people on earth, all the 20,000 SpaceX satellites, by this time it's 100,000 SpaceX or Bezos satellites, uh, creating all this uh, virtual reality in the uh, outer atmosphere of planet Earth. And um, as the Bible predicts, there are a series of events that lead to a catastrophic event. event. Remember that Lucifer and his forces, uh, the Illuminati, the Freemasons, the Masons, the Rosicrucians, Skull and Bones, so on and so forth, their occult operating motto is 
order out of chaos or new world order out of chaos or manufactured crisis or never let a good crisis go to waste. So the Luciferian occultic formula here is kick the world into total chaos then use the chaos as a destabilizing factor to bring in your satanic or Luciferian New World Order, also known as Mystery Babylon, or the return of Mystery Babylon, which was first conceived in ancient Babylon at the time of the Tower of Babel, where the world's first one world government, one world religion, and one world economic system. Uh, came about. Jesus came down to judge that because he could see in their hearts that this was a Luciferian endeavor. So Jesus said that in the last days, Mystery Babylon was going to return. What does that mean? Well, when, when you read Revelation 13 and so many other passages of the Bible, you read about a false prophet who's head of a one world religion and a one world economic system, the Mark of the Beast, 666. It could be a vaccination that could be the delivery mechanism for a uh, coronavirus vaccine, which could also be a smart chip, a nano chip, a DNA chip, uh, a neural implant, a mark of the beast of some kind. How we will determine whether or not uh, a mere vaccination or an injection is the mark of the beast or not is we need to ask ourselves what circumstances are happening uh, along with the, the ceremonial receiving of a microchip implant or a nanochip implant. Are you just receiving, like so many of our troops do, a microchip implant or a nanochip implant? Because they were doing that as far back as Vietnam. They were shooting up our uh, soldiers with what they called the Rambo chip, which was a high-powered uh, caffeine chip that would give them more energy. They were experimenting with uh, microchip and tube, tube implants in our soldiers going back 10, 20, 30, 40 years, and in many other nations too. But this microchip implant, this is, is it could be used for national security, but it could be used as the greatest totalitarian control and lockdown the world has ever seen. 
Now, before I want to get into that, Jesus Christ is talking about the signs of the times in Matthew 24, 25. And this is what Jesus Christ says, and we need to pay attention. We need to read God's prophetic word in, in the Bible. If we don't read God's prophetic word in the Bible, then we have no understanding of, of what the Bible's about, the beginning, the middle, and the end. So it's imperative that you and I rightly divide the Word of God <clears throat> and study to show us, ourselves approve what the Bible actually says. So this is what we read. In, Jesus, in Matthew 24, Jesus Christ is saying, um, and, and Jesus, they said to him, well, Jesus, what's going to be your sign of your coming? Is this, is, the, is this the end of the age? You know what, and before I answer what Jesus Christ said, when my house almost collapsed in, um, in Santa Clarita, it was on a dual epicenter, and it almost split in two during the earthquake. All of my, this was in the dark. It sounded like a locomotive train going at 100 miles an hour had split through our house and it shook back and forth. It sounded like a nuke went off. And uh, everybody ended up going up to uh, our driveway because we, we, our driveway was longer. We're, we were at the end of the cul-de-sac and, and all the lights were off and stuff and pieces, people's houses were shaking. And I had two or three people come up to me who were not Christians some who were Jewish, some who were in the entertainment industry. And a bunch of them said, hey, Paul, because they knew I was a author and a Christian writer who had written some prophecy books. So they said to me, Paul, they, they initiated the conversation. They said, Paul, are these the, the signs that Jesus Christ talked about? Are these the signs of the end of the world? And I must have been asked that question dozens of times over the next year as the aftershocks came. Continually, I've been asked that question by usually non-Christians. And I keep getting asked that question as people see what they perceive are prophetic signs. They want to know, is this the end of the world? Because they're hungry for God. That's why they're asking the question. So uh, Jesus says these words. Um, and Jesus answered them and said to them, Take heed that no one deceives you. For many will come in my name, saying, I am the Christ, and will deceive many. So we've had, met, over the uh, century, we've had many false Christs, false prophets, false gurus, false gods, false prophets, false teachers. And you will hear of wars and rumors of wars. See that you are not troubled, for all those things must come to pass. But the end is not yet, for nation will rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom. And there will be famines, pestilences, and earthquakes in various places. All these are the beginning of sorrows. So what Jesus Christ is telling us is that nation will rise against nation. The actual translation of that is ethnos, which where we, that's where we get the word ethnic group. Or uh, ethnos is an e ethnic group or a, a racial group. So, so when it says wars and rumors of wars, it's talking about wars between one ethnic group or one racial group against another racial group and another ethnic group. So race wars in particular was predicted by Jesus Christ as a sign of the last days. And, and we see that here in America and the European Union and in the Middle East and in South America, Africa, across the world. It is not just the racial discord uh, being stirred up by uh, activists and organizers and protests or, or people who are uh, uh, racist. No, no. This, this, uh, this uh, baiting for a race war is part of a Marxist strategy to divide and conquer the United States and, Jesus, and another nations. And Jesus predicted it. And then Jesus said these words, For nation will rise against nation, and kingdom against kingdom. And there will be famines, pestilences, and earthquakes in various places. In California, we're constantly having cataclysmic earthquakes. That's how I got into writing books on Bible prophecy. It was an earthquake that almost collapsed my house. 
Um, and then it says, all these are the beginning of sorrows. Jesus Christ is making the comparison between a woman who's pregnant, and you know, when a woman's pregnant, she, <clears throat> she keeps getting biological signs as if she's having birth pains, and it feels literally as if a baby is coming. And then finally, a woman will break water, and the birth pains will be, become more accelerated, and then she goes into giving birth. And by that time, hopefully, she's in a hospital uh, being taken care of. So, so a woman, even if it's her first baby, God gives a woman some big clues as to when the baby's coming. I know, I spent time with my wife uh, when she was about to give birth to our first child, a boy, <clears throat> and then a year later I spent uh, more time with my wife when she was about ready to give birth to our twins, a boy and a girl. So we had three kids in two years, and God uh, gave birth pains, and she couldn't take any painkiller, and it was intense and yet the whole room was filled with this joy. These doctors and nurses who deliver babies day after day, I would have thought they would have been cynical and hardened, but they weren't. They were delighted to, to uh, handle and welcome and celebrate a brand, two brand new human beings and another brand new human being into the world. It was a wonderful thing. It was like watching secular people witness a miracle and they knew it was a miracle. And that's the joy of, of childbirth, and that's what Christ is talking about, and that's, that's, that's the metaphor. What, try, what Jesus Christ is trying to pass along to you regarding um, um, a signs of the times, what Jesus Christ is trying to pass along to you and to his church is this. Jesus Christ doesn't want you and me as members of his church or as ministers or as preachers, or just ordinary Christians, he doesn't want us to pass on to the world fear, hysteria, nightmares, doom and gloom, uh, horror, zombie apocalypse, despair, madness, suicide. The world already has that. The world has plenty of that. It's not that Jesus doesn't want us to tell the tough truth. He does. He does. Because the book of Revelation tells us the tough truths that during the tribulation period, there is a very complete listing of all the judgments and the outpouring of God's wrath and the super earthquakes and the, the cataclysmic uh, uh, signs and the moon being turned to red and the sun being turned black and, and uh, disease outbreaks and tsunamis and earthquakes and famines and wars and rumors and wars and it keeps accelerating and when you read the book of Revelation <clears throat> I mean it's, it's, it's more it's more intense than any horror book okay entire populations go down it's, it's, it's horrific, but, but the purpose of the book of Revelation and a, and a listing of all the plagues and calamities, God is not putting it there because he's sadistic and cruel. A lot of Christians don't understand that the entire message of the book of Revelation is the personal, infinite, living God of the universe reaching out with total love to you to everyone you know, and to mankind. God is forced to use these most dramatic wake-up calls to shake the earth, to shake his people, both Jews and Gentiles, into jarring them into accepting the Messiah, Jesus Christ, as their Lord and Savior. That's the purpose of all these uh, cataclysmic judgments. And the uh, first three and a half years of the tribulation, and then the second three and a half years of the tribulation period. God, this is not doom and gloom. God is constantly reaching out to mankind in the middle of the tribulation period. God is constantly calling mankind back to himself and providing a way of rescuing, providing deliverance. God promises to deliver his people from the wrath to come. God promises to make a way where there is no way. 
and God promises to supernaturally deliver his people and uh, rescue them. And in the middle of all this calamity, you have 144,000 Jewish evangelists preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ. You have two angels preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ. You have the two witnesses preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ, and then they drop dead, and then they're resurrected from the dead, and the whole world is watching them. So this is no, this is no, uh, this thing doesn't wind down. That's why it's called the apocalypse, the, the, the great unveiling, the great revealing. This is history's final moment, and, and what happens here is that Jesus Christ returns to the earth along with the armies of heaven, and Jesus Christ comes to Israel, Jerusalem. He doesn't come to Brooklyn. He doesn't come to LA. He doesn't come to uh, uh, Hoboken, New Jersey, or, uh, you know, Cannes Film Festival. He comes to Jerusalem, where he said he would return. You see, that's why, that's why it's obvious that God is not finished with the covenant, that the everlasting covenant he made with Abraham and his physical descendants. God gave the Jews a promise of inheriting the promised land, all of Israel, as an everlasting promise. That means it cannot be taken away. And when the Jews go through the process of the tribulation period, what will happen in that, what's called the seven years of Jacob's trouble, okay, what happens is that the Jews go through this most intense purification process the Jews are seduced by the Antichrist and they sign a three and a half year uh, peace treaty with the Antichrist and the false prophet. Uh, but the Antichrist betrays the Jews and Israel three and a half years into the peace treaty. He totally betrays Israel. Then the Antichrist sends his armies and they pursue Israel and they pursue the armies of Israel. And the armies of Israel and the Jews hide up in the rock fortress of Petra. And then finally at the end of the book of Revelation, you see that Christ conquers the Antichrist, the false prophet, Lucifer, the fallen angels, all the hierarchies of fallen angels and demons, Christ conquers. And Christ conquers every man and every woman, no matter how powerful, who has received the mark of the beast in their right hand or their forehead. Everyone who's received the mark of the beast and has become one with the Antichrist hive mind or world brain is permanently uh, uh, severed from any possibility of going into heaven. If you, this is the ceremony you would have had to perform to get the mark of the beast, the uh, uh, mark of the Beast chip implant 666 or the biochip implant or the nano chip implant or whatever variety of implant it is, in order to get that you would have to stand up and totally reject Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. You, you, you publicly profess that Jesus Christ is not your Lord and Savior. And then you publicly profess and commit to worshiping the Antichrist as your God, and you pledge to worship the Antichrist as your God, and worship the Antichrist as God, then as you do that, you receive the chip implant, either on the forehead or the uh, right hand. It could be in the layers of tattoos, it could be a biochip, nanochip, neural implant. It'll be wireless, so it'll be a computer to brain interface where there's no wired technology. It'll be faster than 5G. They will be able to read your mind, which they can already do on a primitive level. They'll be able to read your mind, your thoughts, words, uh, pull out memories, conflicts, detect your emotional mood, uh, happy, sad, whatever, detect when you're lying or not lying. And you're plugged into the Mark of the Beast system. You, you are not free to go to a church or anything else. You, you have signed, sealed, and delivered your, uh, your, you made a deal with the devil, you sold your soul to get the, the, the microchip implant. And so, all those people that 
sold their souls to get the microchip implant, you cannot enter heaven. Your name cannot be written in the book of life. It's really serious. Now, if you refuse to take the mark of the beast, if you refuse to receive the microchip implant, the 666 in your hand or forehead or whatever, then you'll, you'll still be saved. If you choose to refuse the mark of the beast, 666, you will be saved. But as an earthly consequence for your rebelling against the Antichrist and refusing to join their one world religion <clears throat> and one world economic system, you're going to have your head chopped off as a, as a penalty for receiving, for, excuse me, for rejecting the mark of the beast. It's very serious and gruesome, but that will be a nanosecond experience. You will, won't even begin to feel it. To be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. So as it, it appears scary on one hand, boom, you will be absent from your physical body. You will be present with the Lord in heaven in your brand new glorious body with all the other saints who rejected the mark of the beast. And there'll be tremendous ecstasy, worship at the marriage supper of the Lamb as the bridegroom Jesus Christ has supernaturally returned to gather his bride <clears throat> and he's not coming to, to gather uh, you know ancient uh, fallen Babylon uh, the great harlot he's coming to get the pure body of Christ so this should meditating on these truths understanding these truths understanding you can't lose your salvation understanding that it's not dependent upon you to carry the weight of this. God's supernatural power and anointing will carry this. But you are victorious. And you know why you're victorious? Because when you chose to receive Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, by faith, you put your faith in Christ to cleanse you of all your sins, and then you invited Christ into your life to make you born again, and after you became born again, you became a brand new creature in Christ Jesus. And that means you are guaranteed 100% to enter into the kingdom of heaven and spend all your life in eternity with Jesus Christ. So to be absent from the body, pow, in a nanosecond, is to be present with the Lord. The Lord's going to look at you, his eyes fill with love and glory as you appear before him in heaven. And the Lord's going to look at you, and with eyes of total love, he's going to say, Well done, thou good and faithful servant. Welcome into the kingdom. And you will enter the kingdom of heaven with a brand new glorified body at the perfect age. You will enter the new heaven, the new earth, the new Jerusalem. The old heaven and the old earth will be burned up because they're defiled. And you will live in paradise forever. And all those that were enemies of the true God, and all those who pledged to worship Satan as God, they're going to spend all eternity in the, the, the lake of fire, um, a cosmic prison, and they will not be able to get out. All eternity they'll be confined from ever appearing in heaven. So it's sobering, but it's good news. It's called the good news of Jesus Christ if you act upon it by faith. See, it's not bad news no matter what you've done in your life. And this is not like sloppy grace. No matter what you've done in your life, no matter what errors you've committed, what sins you've committed, and there's nobody listening to me. Everybody has committed sins. And so if you had to get into heaven based on your performance, you would be depressed. The reality is you get into heaven because of grace, unmerited favor. You simply ask God. You don't deserve it. It's unmerited favor. So you put your faith in Jesus to save you based on your faith, unmerited favor, and he'll do that. And that's why it's good news, because you're not earning something that you couldn't possibly earn. You're simply receiving salvation as a free gift. And that tells you just how much God loves you. I'm Paul McGuire. You're listening to a prophetic emergency alert. And you need to know about that. You know, we live in strange times. 
I don't want to say bad things, but what if you were to get the coronavirus and you had some cofactor or whatever? You know, what if that would happen and you were to be unexpectedly taken away from this planet? I'm not trying to scare you, but are you ready to, to go to heaven? Do you know that if you died tonight, seriously, do you know that you know that you know that if you died tonight, you would uh, uh, be guaranteed entrance into heaven? Or, or are you very nervous that if you were to die tonight, because deep down inside, you don't know whether or not you're going to heaven? Well, if you don't know whether or not you're going to heaven, it means that the issue is not decided, and you should be worried. Every person who has prayed the sinner's prayer and invited Christ into their lives to go into heaven, every single person who did that and meant it when they said that prayer, they received this supernatural assurance from God through the power of the Holy Spirit, where if you ask them, do you know where you're going when you die? They can look you in the eye and peacefully tell you, hey, I know that I know that I know I'm going to heaven because I asked Christ to save me and I put my faith in Jesus Christ. And when they say those words with peace, I know that I know that I know that I'm going to heaven, they mean it. And so you see, you can know down here on earth before you die, you can know for a certainty whether or not you're going to heaven. God created two worlds after death. One is hell for all those who have rejected salvation, and the other is heaven, a place of eternal reward. And you don't get into heaven by being good, you get into heaven by having faith in Christ's ability to forgive you of your sins. So I want to, I mean, I'm saying I would like to invite you, because you never know <coughs> uh, what may happen in the future. And, and the point of this is not to scare you or manipulate you. This is, this is something that should be communicated with joy and excitement. Who would want to live in this world system, as so many do, thinking they're here by evolutionary accident, that there's no reason for their life? How, how tragic. That's not truth. Jesus Christ said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father but through me. God bless you. I'm Paul McGuire. Visit paulmcguire.us and spread this message far and wide. That's paulmcguire.us.